best practices from the field of career development with other colleagues from your access uh, uh, network. So, Christina, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, Samana, I'm just not sure whether you see my screen. Yes, we can. We can see it. The main one. And if I check, there's still the. Right. Uh, there is a slide who's so. So I'm just up. I'm sure that this is the right screen. Oh, I support that. It's fine. Well, thank you, Simona, for introducing our uh, study tour. Uh, thank you, all participants, for being here. So, we're in a very small committee today. That's why I would love to ask you to put your camera on so we could see each other. Um, my name is Christina, Christina Bjerkut. I'm training trainer and international cooperation manager at ABG, Association Bernard Grigori. And so this morning we will be presenting you our mainly our uh, cross-border actions for supporting sectoral and international mobility of PhD candidates and holders. So thank you very much for um, registration for this tour. Um, quickly before your introduction, a few words on ABG. Well, I suppose you already, some of you already know us. Um, some others will you saw the, the introduction on the, on the visit. So we are a French nonprofit organization established almost 42 years ago uh, in the 80s, um, 1980. And from the very beginning, our mission was and still um, help PhD holders to transit from academia to private sector to industry no matter the fields and seniority, and also help companies recruit these um, PhD holders. Um, so this is us in a very quick way. Uh, also, before we go deep into our actions, I would love to hear from you, uh, who's who, uh, or just quickly your name, country, organization of attachment, so we could see how large our network is. We'd love to start. Adam? Yes, uh, if, if you call, it's easier. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Okay, I'm happy to start. It just took me two seconds to put the microphone on. Good morning, everyone. My name is Adam Molnar, and here in this specific event, I participate as a member of the Hungarian Euraxis Network, actually coordinating the institution is uh, Bajzoltan Nonprofit LTD, where I work. It's a uh, in two words, it's a research performing organization for applied research, very close to the private sector, actually. And uh, we don't have too much international mobility, and we would like to improve that in hand in hand with uh, career development actions. And this is why I'm here to see good practices. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Janka? Shankar, I'm not sure if yeah. everyone's. Yeah. Uh, so my name is uh, Janka Kotulova, and uh, uh, here I'm uh, representing. I'm a member of the uh, Euraxis uh, Slovakia. I work at SAYA, Slovak Academic uh, Information uh, Agency. Uh, and uh, here I am because uh, my activities are. Uh, uh, I'm more and more involved uh, uh, with uh, helping researchers uh, to reach out beyond academia. Uh, for example, also in the Euraxis Hubs project, we at SAYA were responsible for the uh, matchmaking uh, events for researchers and businesses. Uh, we are organizing the cross-border matchmaking uh, uh, in November in another project. And uh, uh, I'm really curious uh, to find out about the good practice in this, in this field. So thank you. Looking forward to the session today. Thank you very much, Vanka. Vaka? 
Yes, sure. Hi. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Rava Kjara, and I'm Sat. I work at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. Um, like Adam, we are also part of the Eraxis Hubs, and um, I was part of the task 2.5, 2.5, yeah, on, uh, or 2.3, sorry, on gender initiatives, gender equality, uh, and so on. Um, we offer at welcome services here in Sweden. We offer services and supports to both international students and researchers. And I'm here today because our university has initiated um, uh, processes to implement uh, career support for uh, researchers. Um, a few years ago and everything stopped um, because during the pandemic and some change of leadership. Um, so now we are starting again and hopefully this time, um, making it happen. That's why I'm here to get insights and inspiration. Wonderful, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Martina, I know if you're here since we don't see you, or Miriam, Leah. Sure, I can go next. Yes, Miriam. That's okay. I'm really very sorry, but as it's kind of, I start my video, but I'm not sure that <laughs> it's a good idea just because I'm working from, from kind of our cottage house, whatever. I'm Maria, I'm uh, from uh, Finland, from Dandre University, and I work, I'm just, uh, it's one of our strategies to uh, gain here is many researchers, international researchers as possible, and exactly working with them. So it's really very kind of, um, how can I say, important and interesting meeting for me, just because the challenges, I guess, for all of us, there are, although we are trying to uh, offer as many services, as much support and help to them as possible, but still there are quite many open questions, what we can do better. So that's the idea of my joining here too. And, and, and I hope that I get some good and interesting hints for better services for international staff and researchers. Thanks a lot. Wonderful, thank you, Maria. Uh, Lea, are you here? Or Martina? Let us know if you have some technical problems. Um, and also, if you would, would love to introduce yourself. I also have uh, colleagues of mine, Florian, Patrine, also our guest, special guest, Malu. Um, so each of them will introduce themselves a little bit later. So that's why I will, I will cut this, this introduction part a little bit shorter. Um, so, well, it's really nice to see you, to hear you, um, to see that the network is really huge and that well, the, we all, trying to pursue the same uh, goals in this uh, career development of PhD holders. So that's wonderful. Um, so about the this visit tour, first we will start with our um, key, key activities in supporting PhD holders, um, basically our different um, trades, recruitment training, information, and international in all of this on international level. Then um, I will be talking about different cross-border activities and we will end by also intercultural part of these cross-border activities, cross-border actions, and we'll, we'll finish by your feedback and also um, a little bit of discussion of um, what could be improved on European and worldwide level. So our uh, overall objective is really to, of course, to present what we are doing, but also to get inspired from your feedback. So really don't hesitate to ask your questions during the presentation or to put some insights if you see some parallels so with your activities or what you know that exists somewhere else. So we will start with um, our actions, different actions in supporting PhD career development and how exactly um, PhD, um, ABG help PhDs. Um, so we have 
once again, three trades, recruitment, communication and training, all on national and international level. And for this first part, so I, once again, I have my colleagues with, who, uh, with me who are going to go into details on different actions. And we will start with the recruitment. Florian, I will stop sharing my screen so you can put your presentation also on. So please, Florian. I'm putting my presentation on. Do you see it? Yes, perfect. <laughs> Great, I'm, I'm happy to be here with you. So I'm Florian Lacour and I work at uh, ABG and mainly in recruitment activities. Um, I work with Laurence Frito. She's my manager. We are her team. And I'm going to introduce you uh, how activities. So as you know, ABG is uh, an expert in career development and in recruitment of PhDs. On our website, you can post offers like job offers, thesis, and internship offers. The public is PhD and different students, doctoral, master, and engineering students. And for, for sure, for every discipline. The particularity of our website is, yeah, is that you can do a multi-distribution of the offers. For example, recruiters can uh, expand the distribution of the offer on or access jobs. I will detail uh, this later. And you also have a free access on our civil library. Of course, our website is available in English. You can switch uh, from French, French to English, English uh, to French. So what about our access multi-distribution? <clears throat> Since 2020, um, we had uh, more than 500 uh, job offers with our access multi-distribution which represents 21% of the total job offers. It's a good number, we are happy, uh, because it works pretty well. And in two years, we had 2,600 uh, job offers on uh, our website. And among these ones, there are 8% of the offers um, which are posted by uh, foreigners, uh, by foreign uh, recruiters. This percentage uh, can be considered as low because um, I'm pretty sure it's due to the COVID-19. You know, the recruiters were shy to post different offers and post different offers in, in foreign countries, of course. So we hope that this percentage will, will be higher uh, very soon. I'm pretty sure you are asking yourself that which countries are posting on our website. Then actually recruiters are from 50, uh, 54 different countries. Uh, it represents a lot of countries. And the principal ones are Belgium, Canada, Luxembourg, Switzerland, and Japan. Also, I want to detail this graph, but um, all our foreign job offers concern um, all the scientific expertise. So it's pretty good here. Um, we have also some principal ones, but it's uh, pretty, uh, there are a lot of expertise. If we look at the recruiters, we see that half of them are from universities, school, and research organizations. Um, I think it's due to the postdoctoral uh, offers. We have a lot of postdoctoral offers in our website. And this type of organization, of course, are, are posting them. And the other part is a private company. 
In ABG, uh, we are also able to optimize the performance of the recruitment of PhDs, uh, thanks to personalized services. Uh, for example, it can be contact research laboratories. Um, the aim is to help the, uh, the recruiters to, to recruit uh, the perfect PhD for them. So it can be contact research laboratories, uh, do a screening of candidates, make a short list of the bait candidates, do a direct approach, uh, which means that uh, uh, we, we will identify the expert profiles for in the, with the most appropriate channels, elaborate a recruitment strategy, and propose the relevant CV to recruiters. It depends on uh, what wants the company. Um, as you can see here, uh, Josefina Jimenez, who is the director of, of research and innovation at Artimon Company, um, has uh, contacted us uh, for help, for help, um, for helping her to recruit a PhD. And she said that we were looking for a doctor in human and social sciences with a strong sensitivity to new technologies. ABG support was very important for us because we lacked experience in recruiting this type of profile. Thus, we were accompanied in all stages of recruitment. I am happy with the results because we found the right candidates. So it's pretty good here. It shows that we have a good feedback uh, of these personalized uh, services. Uh, if you need more explanation, do not hesitate to, to tell me. Uh, in our team, we also organize events such as job webinars, uh, which consist to invite uh, PhD people working outside academic domain. The aim is uh, for uh, PhD students or young PhD is to discover the different kind of jobs for them. For example, uh, the last webinar were about technical commercial occupation, the scientific uh, me and medical communication professions and the consulting professions. Of course, webinars are online. We can also do a doc. It's not online, it's uh, in physics. Um, we can organize them with partners. In April, we organized an doc with L'Alliance about a startup in biohealth. You have a picture with them. And uh, the aim of the Aperodoc is to meet professional uh, to, to allow, to, to facilitate the recruiter between young PhDs and uh, professionals, PhDs. And also discuss uh, about uh, car career pursuit, entrepreneurship. It depends on the thematic. Uh, this is the kind of thing we can do, uh, for example, with you, with uh, partners. Uh, we, we choose thematic, we choose partners, and we can organize it. If you have any ideas, uh, we can discuss about, the, about this. And we also do some intervention in universities schools, employment programs, and welcome days for doctoral students. We are used to, to do that. Then if you have any question, you can ask me directly, or you can contact Laurence Frito, my manager, or, or me. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Florian, very much. I will be back to my presentation and also talk about our communication um, communication team. Oh, here we go for the presentation. So in our communication trade, communication department, we also have two people. Um, well, unfortunately, they're not here with us, but I will um, anyway share your na uh, their names. Um, so the, the manager of this uh, department is Veronique Dupont, and also um, we have a communication officer with Sam Ben Fada. So they are working always um, 
to present a tailored communication in French and in English with original content, but also materials from our partners. So well, our website, the main um, place where we gather information, but we also have monthly newsletters for scientists and employers. Um, in these newsletters, well, there's very various uh, information from different news that might be interesting well, for companies and of course for researchers, uh, interviews with some testimonials, from uh, recruiters, uh, HR people, but also PhD holders who are now working in different um, positions in companies or who realize um, immobility, different postdoc contracts. And they are also giving their testimonials on the international experience. Um, also, we're present on social uh, network, so LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, um, everywhere. On LinkedIn, we even have the biggest majority of uh, our community, uh, where the, of course, PhD holders, R&D and very nice stakeholders, um, different academic and industrial uh, people presenting well, connecting also with our community. And it's not only in France, but of course abroad, well, it's the group open to everyone. Um, the communication department also, of course, communicate on our recruitment campaigns, different events, which Florian just uh, introduced you, our different um, relations with um, companies. So we have also dedicated pay pages of uh, our partners when we explain uh, in details uh, companies activities, why it could be interesting for PhD holders and why the company uh, companies are interested in PhD holders. So it's really a source of different kind of information. And also the communication department organizing um, ABG professional pitch contest. So it's completely different from my thesis in uh, 180 seconds. Um, so here, of course, it's still pitch uh, on the stage, um, but their PhD holders or PhD candidates in the very late um, staging of their PhD. They communicate on their career plan in front of, of course, diverse audience, but especially in front of professional jury. And so this contest is held always during um, a Parisian career fair called PhD Talent Career Fair. So it's always um, in Paris. Um, we have some different partners for this organization. Well, first PhD Talent, and then um, um, it could be National Network of Doctoral College uh, Colleges, or also our um, partners from industry. Uh, and the principle of this competition is really um, to help PhD candidates and PhD holders to convince the jury uh, and the public of um, about their skills, their expertise in a very concise way. They just have two minutes. Um, so the jury is always executive from uh, well, ex executives and business leaders. Um, and of course, it's not just the idea is not to create a contest and this uh, show, but especially to propose a very formative experience for these PhD holders. Because first, um, when we launch the call for candidates, we guide these potential candidates in the preparation of the pitch, of the communication, how to communicate on their skills and on their um, future career goals. And then once um, 
candidates uh, are selected. We also provide individual coaching session that will proposed by our trainers um, and really helping once again, these participants to improve their communication, really to talk about themselves in a very efficient way. And then once again, after the, this context, finalists, uh, all, all participants uh, selected, have the opportunity also to network with the jury. And it's true that uh, in all our activities, network is a kind of keyword, like the major hashtag, because we're trying not just to be an actor for PhD holders and companies, but create links between different stakeholders around uh, doctorate. Um, so this is communication department, and then um, we will continue with our training department. Catherine, are you ready also to share your slides? Yes. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm Catherine, and I'm going to uh, share some slides with you. Um, not the right one, sorry. <laughs> Should be. It's not working. Sorry about that. Okay. I'm not sure why you can't see my slide. Well, we see, but it's not on the full screen. Yeah. Yeah, when? And then you have the <laughs> next slides too. Okay, I do something like that. Is that is that okay? Can you see the yeah? The first slide, yes. Yeah, the first slide. Okay. Okay. So let's go. Uh, so I'm Catherine. I'm a training manager at uh, and a coach at uh, ABG, and uh, we are a team of uh, four people. Uh, you can uh, see our nice, nice uh, faces. So, uh, Sophie is our manager, and then you have Dao, um, Sandra, and uh, myself. We all come from uh, different uh, backgrounds. Uh, there are some people from finance, some, uh, some who were working in the physics, uh, and uh, I was a, a biologist. And uh, we all um, coach and train uh, PhD uh, students and PhD holders, but uh, not only. And uh, here I can show you some um, of our uh, training activities. We basically uh, reach around uh, 3,000 people a year, uh, 3,020 people uh, last year. Uh, of course, PhD students and PhD holders, they are the, the main uh, people we, we see, but we also reach uh, master students. We have some uh, dedicated trainings uh, to help them decide if they want or not to, uh, to continue and do finally a, a PhD after their master's uh, uh, studies. And we um, have also developed those past years some specific trainings for PhD supervisors. As you know, it's really important for PhDs to be well uh, guided during this uh, nice period. <laughs> so, uh, and we try to help uh, the supervisors to manage their PhDs uh, as a uh, uh, from best as possible. <laughs> and we also uh, guide and uh, coach uh, senior researchers, and we have also developed uh, specific trainings for uh, managers, um, team managers uh, in, in the academic sector mainly. But our trainings um, are uh, oriented uh, really to help PhDs, PhD students to, uh, to continue in the more socioeconomic sector. We encounter pure people from all areas of research, and we do trainings, of course, in France, but also in Europe, Italy, Spain, mainly. Uh, but Christina, you can, <laughs> I'm sure you will speak about that a bit later, or maybe make it. And uh, a little bit around the world, but not that much for the moment. As you can see, we are a, a team of uh, 13 people, so we, <laughs> we cannot uh, cover all the world. Uh, we've done 200 days of trainings and conferences uh, last year, and we also do individual and career guidance and coachings. 
and we uh, offer online tools and I will uh, speak a little bit uh, later about uh, those tools too because that might be interesting for the your public too. Um, as I said, we um, reach different uh, publics, different kind of uh, people, and here you have all services uh, we do for our public, so we have not exactly the same training, of course, for masters and managers, so here you can have an overview of uh, the kind of uh, uh, trainings uh, we do for each uh, category of people. So for master students, we have thematic workshops. Um, I have some slides later, so you can have an overview of all the themes that we cover. We have a specific training uh, so for, for them to help to help them decide if they want to do a PhD or not. And we also do uh, quite a lot of individual coachings because those questions, should I do a PhD or not, are yeah, usually takes time to think about. And so they come uh, to, uh, to get some advice and some, uh, some coaching from us. Uh, for PhD and PhD students, we also have, of course, thematic workshops. And what we do uh, all also are, is a um, three-day seminar. Uh, so it's three-day seminars uh, where you, you can get uh, trainings, but also we, we, uh, we help them to network. So we organize a lot of networking events uh, to help them to, uh, to uh, have an overview of what are the job opportunities and what kind of skills they can transfer from the academic sector uh, to a, another environment. Um, Florian said that we do a, a product, so that's something, an activity we share between the recruitment and training. And we also do individual and uh, group training uh, for PhD students. So we uh, guide them uh, during several um, sessions to help them get the right tools to introduce themselves uh, in the good way for the academy, for the economic sector. And we help them to, to think about uh, their, what they want, uh, what they wish to do uh, for their future. Uh, so also training for PhD supervisor, a senior researcher. We have a specific training uh, coaching program uh, for senior researchers that uh, are still in the academic sector, but uh, want maybe to add an activity or want to have a, a new vision of their activity or maybe switch from the academic sector to another environment. And of course, we do um, tailor-made training, so uh, we, we are uh, always happy to hear from our customers or um, wishes. Here are the thematic workshops, workshops and conferences uh, we do. Uh, so basically, we cover many topics um, um, focused, of course, on the, on the career development. Um, so it might be uh, how to set my career goals or how to explore the job market, how to uh, market my skill, how to uh, highlight the, the good points, uh, the added value of my uh, experience uh, in uh, another environment. It might be how to network, and it might be also how to uh, um, design and uh, tailor my communication tools for the uh, sector I, I wish to, to join. So with this, we do um, sometimes one to two hours conferences, and it might be half a day session, it might be two days, it might be three days, depending on the, on the demand. Uh, I told you that we also uh, share online tools. So we can, uh, the first one is dedicated more to PhD students. And this is a tool that you can uh, download on our website. And it's really a tool for PhD students to assess their skills uh, all along their three years or sometimes more of their experience. And uh, it's a useful tool for them to uh, to be confident uh, that they develop skills and those skills they will be able to, uh, to transfer them and uh, they really have value that they can uh, market to uh, recruiters. And the second one is a tool that you can find online and which is, has been designed for PhDs uh, all along their career. Um, I have some slides to share regarding that poll. Maybe you know already about that, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, so it's a skills portfolio, and uh, it has been designed by Abhi, of course, and uh, some of uh, our partners. 
And uh, in a few words, uh, Doug Pro has been uh, made to describe PhD skills in a common language uh, to the academic and the socioeconomic uh, sectors. And it has also been designed for uh, PhDs to create a specific portfolio and uh, be able to um, practice presenting their skill and uh, showcase them. So it looks like this. <laughs> you can have a look on the website to get, have more details, but uh, it looks like this. So as you can see, we have um, described 24 skills uh, that are divided in four categories. So you have uh, some skills really linked to core competencies, some linked to personal and interpersonal qualities, some are linked to how to manage activities and create values. And the last category is uh, strategy and leadership. So four categories, 24 skills that are uh, common, are common, yeah, common competences that you develop uh, when you're a PhD. So here you don't find the scientific ones, you, you find more the transverse uh, skills and the personal skills. And if you have a closer look to, uh, to one of the bullet points, uh, for example, project management, which is one of the skills of force that main, uh, main of the PhD uh, develop, uh, you will see that there are like uh, three levels of maturity of the skill. So each skill is described. So it's really helpful for PhD so, uh, so that, that they can understand better um, what are the requirements uh, of recruiters for a PhD. And it helps them to have the good vocabulary to speak also about this uh, specific uh, competence, uh, project management competence. So the first level is mainly um, a PhD, a normal PhD experience, someone with some young PhD. Uh, second phase would be more um, uh, someone, somebody who already has some experience. So maybe uh, somebody who is doing project management or somebody who is doing uh, people management. And the third phase is usually correspond to somebody that uh, has done uh, quite a lot uh, of, um, of research or other experience and maybe as more a strategic position. So as you can see, really you can uh, use this tool to assess your skills all along your career in, from a young PhD some, to somebody who has more, more experience. And the last thing that uh, Doug Pro uh, helps you uh, to do is that uh, the tool is asking um, the PhD to uh, assess, of course, uh, the, the level of maturity regarding a skill, but also um, is asking you to uh, explain specifically uh, how you develop this skill. So it uh, basically uh, asks you to um, write down some a story, a situation uh, where you have developed these skills, and uh, so you can really, uh, it really, it's a really helpful tool to prepare a job uh, interview. Okay, that's uh, all I wanted to say. Uh, uh, so short presentation on our activities and the pro. Uh, don't hesitate, of course, if you have questions. I don't know, Christina, do we take question at the end, maybe? Yeah, or? Yeah. yeah, okay. Thank you, Catherine, very much. Okay, thank you. That's all for me. Okay, I will show once again this screen. Going back to the last trade that we have at ABG. Uh, there's something going on. Wait, I lost my track. Sorry for a little bit of wait. Dun, dun, dun. There's something happening with my presentation. Here we are, and now I'm sharing the screen. Okay, Ooh, finally. <laughs> um, so the last trade, as I, I'm saying, as I'm naming it, um, it's our international partnership department. Um, well, there are also two people there, um, as I say, in recruitment and in communication. Uh, first, Meliki Reole, uh, 
my manager, international development manager, and well, myself. Um, and what we do in our international department, basically, well, all the activities mentioned before, we do this at the international level. Of course, mostly in Europe, but also we have cooperation in Canada, in the United States, um, and um, the same for the audience. It starts from masters students to very experienced researchers, including supervisors. We're also working on development of our network, our partners and clients. These are universities, uh, research organizations, companies, public institution, diplomatic institution, uh, including some um, technology offices at embassies, and also other different associations of companies and PhDs uh, in Europe. Um, and that's why, um, well, we're present and the events um, on the European uh, level between European actors, like, uh, just to give you some examples, ESOV, uh, also PRIDE, Professionals in Doctoral Education, um, European University Association were also present there. Um, and each time we're trying really ex exchange information and also will discuss good practices and just promoting what we are doing, but the same as for you to get inspired. And um, about the trainings also, well, we do this in English as well. And regarding this part, we have two main activities. First, we support a Marie Curie Actions Project for the career development of the fellows. So we provide some trainings really tailored um, to, the, to the project. And also we support, um, we provide support to researchers in exile. And uh, same if they're, oh, you saw Paul's logo, it's a national program for researchers in exile in France. But also, if you're working with researchers or doctoral candidates at risk in your country, so we're, of course, interesting um, discussion and collaboration also to see, so can we um, maybe collaborate and launch uh, this support also in international um, or cross-border level? And, well, this, uh, you see, of course, on website, uh, we have visitors uh, from foreign countries. It's uh, about 38% um, visitors outside France. Um, so some public um, from abroad. And um, on our website, what is uh, by trying to, well, it's been years that we're uh, proposing um, international information. Well, of course, we we'll also have Twitter and uh, newsletter, international newsletter, which I mentioned on communication. So once again, we're doing the same thing on international level. But we're trying really to collect various resources dedicated to international mobility. So um, um, what, what is inside first? different um, mobility schemes, um, some fellowships um, on different level to start PhD abroad or for a short-term mobility, long-term mobility, also for confirmed researchers. So it's really uh, open to everyone. And so we'll, if it's something that you um, interested in, of course, you can refer to this international mobility guide for um, your public, for your audience, and also use these resources. Once again, available in, Fran in French and in English. Um, and we're trying to, well, you see the map, so it's 
the the main concentration of course in Europe, but since we're in touch with um, these researchers, new generation of research researchers, we also see that some who they also have interest in uh, more exotic countries uh, to go to Singapore or exotic, uh, let's outside of Europe um, to go, yes, to, to Brazil, to Argentina. Um, so we're trying also to reply to this request and to find information that could be interesting for researchers who are trying to also go outside of Europe. Um, and for this, we're also collaborating with our partners, embassies, and we'll, we're open to, to have information even from you to disseminate this to international level and uh, to provide some, of course, intersectoral mobility. So really, if you have some event or if you are also in charge of promotion of some fellowships, don't hesitate to, to send me an, an email and to see whether we'll, of course, we can promote this and uh, trying to gather, uh, to make it this, um, to promote this to the larger audience. Um, so this is a uh, international department and Basically, our main trains, once again, recruitment, communication, trainings, and everything of it on international level. So uh, I will take some questions. We will take some questions um, if you have some. Yes, Janka. First of all, uh, thank you very much for this interesting presentation. I must say, uh, we envy you a little bit. We envy France for having such a fantastic organization because of any activity, I can think you have it. Um, but I was um, um, curious about uh, what you mentioned about the recruitment. Um, actually, that you also support companies in recruiting the right uh, candidates. Uh, you also outlined uh, some activities uh, that you do uh, in this uh, regard. Um, and I just wanted to ask about a little bit the profiles of those people who are actually assisting in the recruitment, uh, since I can imagine that it's many times like very specific job positions. Um, what, does it, what does it actually take to be able to support um, in, the, in the recruitment uh, of uh, for such positions, that would be my first question. Maybe then I have a later uh, few more, but that's um, what I want to thank you. At, at this moment, it's also uh, principally uh, private companies that uh, ask us. Um, it can concern PhDs in um, human sciences, uh, in mathematics, uh, in biology. So pro profiles of PhD are pretty large. Um, it's uh, the man, yes, the big part of um, how help is about um, uh, a long term uh, for a long term contract. It's not for postdoctoral contract, for example. Um, I I don't know if it's uh, if I answer to your question. But uh, uh, the person who is assisting in the recruitment process, uh, choosing, for example, a suitable candidate and, and actually providing the guidance on the process, uh, uh, does he or he have to have a background, for example, in the specific disciplines, or it, that's not uh, like uh, inevitable? Yeah, actually, it's our team, Laurence and I. Uh, we, are, we are recruiting uh, researchers for the companies. We, are both, uh, we have both a PhD in biology. But we are able to, to adapt uh, the recruitment for physics uh, profiles, something like that. But for this moment, it's, uh, it's much pretty well. <laughs> and especially that you have previous experience in companies. Mm. Like you've been in touch also with HR department. Mm -hmm. It's true. So, La sure. Laurence. Uh, um, she's been working for many, many years in the uh, um, 
for and biotech. Medical. Yeah, and Kelly's, which is the ah. biggest uh, recruitment and consulting agency company. Yeah. So uh, she's been in the charge of the recruitment for many, many years, finding uh, like sort of headhunters. Um, I think Floriana, you also had the, this experience previously. Uh, yeah, Laurence has the biggest experience with uh, 22 years in uh, Kelly's company. And I have also experience, but not in recruitment. Um, but I started at the uh, ABG with recruitment. What is more important, maybe the background from the private sector or some, mm. some that's quite an extensive experience in an HR. It's more, more more important than to have a specific disciplinary uh, expertise in this regard. So thank yeah, you very much. I have experience in private companies and so in associative company, so it, it helps uh, a lot mm -hmm, for sure. Thank you. Yes, Ravaka. Yes, thank you. Um, I actually have two questions. Um, the first one is, um, since, as I say, we are in the process of starting, um, what do you think is more, if you compare um, trainings and individual coaching or any of the other services that you offer, if we have to start with something because it's the, the service that you think that has the most effect, um, uh, in supporting um, the career of uh, PhD holders, what would you say uh, we should start with? Because it's all about uh, resources here, of course, um, with this kind of uh, services. That's the first question. And the second, if I understood well, you um, other universities outside France can contact you uh, if uh, they want to have you um, as trainers. Um, and I don't know if it's possible for you to give uh, an idea of what would it cost for uh, yeah, but an idea of the costs for your for training a webinar on site. Thanks, Catherine. Yes, I can reply for the first part at least. <laughs> As if, uh, uh, in my opinion, the the easier thing to do is to do trainings. Yeah, because you will you will reach more people. And individual coaching is really enriching for both <laughs> the people that is following the coaching and for the coach, but it takes a lot of time and energy. So if you're starting, yeah, really my advice would be to, to do trainings because in one session, half a day, you can maybe reach 15 people, 15 to 20. If, if you have 20, sometimes we do training for 20 people. But uh, yes, I, um, in my opinion, that, that would be the first step. <laughs> Thank you. And to complete about the um, how much it costs, well, Everything will depend on the format, whether it's a half of journey, the full day of, um, of trainings, how many people if it's, and uh, depending on how many participants there are, um, we will see whether we need one trainer or two trainers. So let's say, I, I suppose that's not the, the information that we <laughs> hide. Um, for half of journey in English, we start with uh, 615 euros in English, but it includes uh, of the training itself, the preparation really to tailor the, um, the trainings. And then afterwards participants, of course, also can, uh, contact us for some other advice. So it's not just the training, it's the whole preparation of the, the, the full package. And then it's um, the same to stay in touch with us. It's not something that we propose just for one week after the training. There's no limits, but they can um, contact us and ask for advice. Thank you, very clear. Are there are more questions? Uh, if I may, I would have maybe one more question. Um, uh, in one of the slides where you actually mentioned the job portals, um, the job portal is somehow linked 
do. There was also uh, what kept uh, my attention was there was also a portal from the Czech Republic, like a uh, research jobs C um, set. Um, I think it was called. H how does this uh, collaboration actually looks like, or um, actually? Uh, did they approach or did you approach them? What, what does it mean actually that you are linked to them for maybe both sides? Uh, this multi diffusion, uh, multi distribution. Um, well, I will start <laughs> the answer and then Florian, you correct me if I'm mistaken. Um, well, there's no rule who approach who first. Sometimes it's like mutual feeling that we, <laughs> we must collaborate. That was the case for, for example, the uh, your access job portal. It was also the case uh, with Campus France. So it was like mutual feeling. So there's completely no rule. Uh, we're trying, of course, to expand this multi distribution. And then, well, if someone will contact us, well, we're all also open to this collaboration. And then, technically, how it works. Um, Florian, do you have uh, a clue on multi-distribution? I, I, I don't understand, so. About multi-distribution, how we put this into practice? Um, actually, they have a choice. They, they, they complete the offer online on our website. And at the end, before the payments, they have the, a choice to choose a access, um, because they do both different multi-distribution. And we precise that if they want to have a multi-distribution of our access jobs, the, the offer must be in, uh, in English. And it's just an option. In option, they, they, they put yes or no. And at the end, uh, they validate uh, the offer. And it's directly, uh, the multi-distribution is automatic. Uh, I think it's at mid midnight, there is an, up an update uh, for our access job and uh, you, you can see how our first. But it's yeah. completely automatic. They choose and th they have nothing to do. And I know your question is, this is because it's very important from communication department who's in charge and she knows exactly how technically it's possible, what uh, resources they need to, to put this in practice. Um, well, first I will send you after the, this visit an article explaining this action. And then there is also the, the contact information uh, of Veronique so you can contact her and she will be able to specify uh, how it works exactly. Great, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Do we have more questions on our trades? No. Then I propose you to, before the break, so there will be break in like 30 minutes or so. Um, let's advance a little bit also. Um, well, first, thank you, Florian. Thank you, Catherine, uh, for your intervention. Uh, if you would like to stay, you're welcome. If not, I know that there's the huge amount of work in, in June, so thank you. Um, thank you. Um, so now let me introduce you also our cross-border activities, specifically well, on PhD career development, um, what we're doing. Um, so once again, it's First, initially, it was trainings and some actions on national level that we expanded also on this cross-border level. Um, one of our oldest and um, action in this cross-border uh, activities is cross-border secretarial. Um, the first session was in 2015, so this the first cross-border postdoctoral um, seminar was organized jointly by ABG, the Franco German University, and also uh, our partners, um, the um, National Fund of Research, Fener, and also uh, Luxembourg Institute of Health uh, with Malou. Uh, she will 
provide some testimonials from uh, her experience. Um, the Luxembourg Institute of Science and Technology and also the University of Luxembourg. The idea is, the, the initial idea was to provide a four day seminar with accommodation. So it was in Luxembourg um, where the postdocs, uh, about 24 participants, um, or in employed PhD holders, um, they will spend these four days all together um, doing different individual but also group activities, self-reflection, uh, some discussions on their career goals and how to improve and how, how to develop the, the career plan. So the researchers will um, mainly researchers from France, Germany and Luxembourg uh, and the end of their postdoctoral contract or once again, the ones who are not employed. Um, just a little specific, well, when I talk about researchers from these three countries, it's not because of the country of origins, but because they do the research in this country. So of course it's actually more international than just these three countries. And the goals were, well, of course, to help these researchers find career options outside academic research. Well, our um, specificities, because well, even if, um, we're also working with academia. The, our main mission is to help also uh, these researchers to find their happiness um, in, uh, in industry. And then, well, there are always a presentation, an overview presentation of job market in Europe, specifically in these three countries. And um, with the idea also to show the HR process and the whole recruitment process outside academia, including some cultural differences. It's always was the case to really, to show that uh, in industry, it's different uh, than in academia because in academia, there's always this um, common culture, which is research. Uh, so that's why preparation uh, for the application might be more similar in academia than in private sector. In the private sector, all these cultural differences count because it will also show that these applicants, these candidates are ready to work in the companies. Um, and of course, once again, keywords was network really to, um, or to make acquaintances among the participants, but also with um, uh, PhD holders, um, speakers who were invited to talk about their career path and to provide some inspiration. Uh, well, there, I put some uh, short uh, feedback from the, the very first session. So it's really something that uh, from the very beginning was tailored to uh, not to develop skills, but really to become aware of multiple skills these researchers have. And uh, so this is the something that um, existed several uh, for several years. Then uh, also with partners, um, the same partners in the um, very beginning uh, and for the last three years, um, this workshop also um, was tailored for PhD candidates from all fields. So this one was uh, in the workshop uh, is called uh, PhD, what comes next. And um, so it's not only for postdocs, it's open well, PhD, once again, in the very last stage of the, uh, of the work, uh, once again, from France, Germany, and Luxembourg uh, with an interactive methodology. So in the very 
Um, three years ago, when we decided also to organize to reorganize this workshop for PhD candidates, it was the same partners, uh, French German University and then all Luxembourgish partners, uh, Aliash, Laser, and Placed, uh, and um, University of Luxembourg. And um, last year, we've been also joined by our German partners, University of Trier and Saarland University, uh, that also uh, proposed their candidates to participate. So the target audience really PhD candidates from all fields and all nationalities doing their uh, PhD in France, Germany and Luxembourg, or also PhD candidates doing a joint PhD with one of these three countries. So it's not just um, joint PhD between France and Luxembourg, let's say, but it could be Luxembourg and uh, Sweden. So in this case, uh, candidates are also eligible uh, to came, to apply. Um, and also it's still open to PhD holders um, who obtain their PhD uh, no more than six months and who are, six, uh, who are still unemployed or have a short-term contract. So they're really looking for some, um, some permanent job. And uh, so this seminar and also previous uh, the postdoctoral um, format uh, is held in English. And um, between the goals, once again, um, it allows participants to pinpoint the specific skills, especially the soft skills. Because with technical skills, usually researchers have no trouble to identify this and to communicate on this, to specify how they know how to name it, they know the specific situation when they used them. But soft skills, it's not always the, the, the case. So that's why we are trying to go over the work history to understand the desires, the motivations, also the skills, and uh, all of this um, with the goal to help them define their future career plan and really help them learn how to communicate with recruiters, well, first in these three countries, but of course, some of, of our advice are more broader uh, because we're also working on networking, how to network, how to approach professionals in industry. And this uh, advice uh, common for, well, at least for uh, uh, Europe. And also uh, the particular attention is always paid to international mobility as a part of the career plan. How can they also build their career somewhere else and be comfortable uh, with their uh, past, past experience and really know how to market this all skill set and their expertise, their experience, their full profile and be very comfortable knowing that, well, as a PG holder, for sure they are uh, very much useful in many, many of um, fields and uh, types of organization. And for sure they will uh, find this um, um, this inspiration for their work. Um, more generally, uh, well, the advantages of these cross-border uh, workshops, well, first is international, inter-institutional and interdisciplinary. So it's um, just by these three elements, it helps also to get inspired by other career paths. When participants find each other 
and discuss all the problematics, of the questionings and the reflections. Well, just this space help them well to be aware of uh, all skill set they have and also to learn about cultural context of these different countries, the way uh, in these countries. Um, PhD is seen and also to know about the, well, the recruitment, uh, some cultural codes, and this information, of course, um, comes from trainers, but also from participants. So it's really something that we share all together. And then, well, of course, to provide uh, self-analysis and self-assessment tools for uh, participants really to um, help them gain confidence to realize that they have many, many skills that are very um, looked for by companies. And of course, to create this friendly and international atmosphere to exchange. And also during the COVID, so the last session and the next one in this year, um, this session were organized in online format. And well, it's true that um, the, the work was organized for this um, interactive format. So we were a little bit scared to whether will it be work can, will it be successful? But uh, finally, there's also a positive output on uh, from online format. Uh, well, first, there's also a way to work in a collaborative manner. When we explain ahead of all participants, when they are selected, uh, they should participate. So really to be sure that the camera works, they mic, everything, and to also not to hesitate, even we see each other through screen, to take a parole. So this um, friendly environment is highly highlighted and really to, uh, we try always encourage participants to take a parole and also to express themselves. Um, we're always trying to really um, create some um, different types of sessions. So it's not just we, uh, us communicating on the topic and then there's um, questions, but it could be plenary sessions, some in-group exercises, individual exercises, some networking time, uh, among participants, also we always start with ice breaking sessions. And what is good about this online format is that um, participants who are who live far away and who have some family commitments or other commitments, and sometimes it's difficult to really cancel all of this and be present in during three days. So these types of um, participants can also participate because well the journey is less it's uh, and we have some um, breaks in the session so it's um, more accessible for this type of candidates well this is the general presentation uh, I will stop up for now the the screen and I would love to invite Malu uh, from um, um, Luxembourg Institute of Health, uh, Alou Freitcher. Uh, she's uh, a PhD coordinator um, and uh, she's been with us from the very beginning of this cross border format. So, uh, just a few elements also uh, from her point of view of you why it's important for uh, Luxembourg Institute of Health to, to be a part of this. Please, Malou. Thank you for introducing me. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. And uh, yeah, thanks also for inviting me uh, to this session here so that I can um, explain about the collaboration of our research institute with the uh, Association Bernard Gregory. So I'm from the Luxembourg Institute of Health. It's a biomedical research institute with a strong focus on personalized medicine and translational research. 
So we started working with Association Bernard Grégory in uh, 2015 when we set up uh, the concept of the cross-border postdoctoral. Um, it was at the time where I started to work at um, LIH and the HR manager who was already in contact with ABG asked me whether I would like to be involved uh, in this project. And I was really motivated about it because I already knew uh, ABG uh, from the time when I did my PhD in France. And I've met um, people from ABG at the um, uh, Forum Biotechno in Strasbourg, where they helped me to um, revise and improve my CV. So, um, yeah, uh, we, do ve we developed together with also other research institutions in Luxembourg and the Luxembourg N National Research Fund, um, a four-day career workshop for the postdoctoral researchers uh, with a fixed-term contract. Um, we really wanted uh, to help those people uh, to improve their employability and discover um, different career opportunities. And the event was held at the Luxembourg City Youth Hostel. So we, we organized this um, for three years, uh, always with uh, up to 25 participants. And two to three places uh, in the workshops were um, reserved for young researchers working at LIH or previously employed in our institute. Uh, we have a population of uh, between 20 and 25 uh, postdoctoral researchers. Uh, usually I had to contact um, them individually and personally to invite them um, to participate to the cross-border postdoctoral. And the people who participated, um, they gave us a very positive uh, feedback and all said that they would recommend um, this workshop uh, to other young researchers. However, it was sometimes a little bit uh, complicated to find the two to three um, to fill those uh, two to three places. Uh, therefore, in 2020, we decided um, to switch to another format and to offer a similar workshop to PhD candidates because our PhD candidate pop population is um, bigger. We have uh, about 60 PhD candidates currently. And here we shortened the, um, uh, the format a little bit. Uh, this is a three-day career workshop that is... Um, reserved for the PhD candidates that are in their third or fourth year. And uh, during the pandemic, it was held virtually. Um, but this year, we, this year, we are going to hold it again at the uh, Luxembourg City Youth Hostel. But the major part of the registration fees were always covered by LIH, uh, about uh, 400 euros. We just always asked a small contribution to the participants, about 40 to 50 euros. This was just uh, so that they are more uh, committed to participate in the workshop to avoid any um, cancellations. And that really worked very, long, very well. All those who registered, they also uh, attended uh, during the full duration of the workshop. Um, the people had to um, uh, apply um, to get a place in this workshop by sending a CV and a also um, a short text about their motivation. And um, at LIH, we did then a pre-selection of the participate, uh, participants and this pre-selection was validated by ABG. So why did we choose to um, collaborate with ABG and to participate in those cross-border career workshops? Well, um, first of all, it's an um, a mission of our institute to train the next generation of biomedical researchers and to prepare them uh, for, the, um, employ for the employment market and show them the different possibilities they can have in academia and also uh, in other sectors. And uh, it's even um, a national mission. Actually, we have set up together with the Luxembourg N National Research Fund a national quality framework for doctoral training with different principles on um, structured doctoral training in Luxembourg. And um, one point uh, in this quality framework uh, is that we have to provide appropriate opportunities to the PhD candidates for their professional development and career orientation. So with um, participating in the cross-border career workshops, 
um, really, contrib really contribute to the, uh, fulfilling this principle of the quality framework. What we would like to, um, to do is to help our, our young researchers to identify and valorize the transferable skills that they acquire when they do a PhD or postdoc, and that they manage to market uh, those skills during job interviews. We want to present uh, different job opportunities to them um, outside of public research and academia. We hope that we can enhance their employability uh, in the different sectors. And uh, we also want to show the attractiveness of the greater region for employment so of Luxembourg and the, um, uh, the border regions in France, Germany and Belgium. Uh, what is also in, uh, um, very nice in the format of the cross-border uh, career workshops is that uh, this is a place for networking. You can get in touch with uh, professionals from different sectors and also with PhD holders and PhD candidates that work, uh, that work in different disciplines. So it helps you to um, build a professional network. Um, here I show you some testimon testimonials from LIH participants, for example, at the uh, cross-border um, postdoctorial. One participant uh, told us that it was really a great opportunity to meet other postdocs um, uh, with a similar curric curriculum, even if uh, the people come from other research domains or from other countries. So the person had a lot of nice discussions and now has the, um, really the keys to know uh, what to do um, for the next career step. Another person also attending uh, the postdoctorial told us that um, this workshop can really be recommended to every postdoc because here the postdocs, they get aware of uh, all the possibilities that they have in the greater region. Uh, a few people also said that um, very interesting speakers were invited and the speakers were really open to answer, uh, answer to questions and they addressed very well, relevant topics and issues during the workshop. Um, and people also said that it was a pleasant uh, atmosphere between uh, participants, organizers, and speakers. It was quite an um, informal setting as we were in a youth hostel. So people felt really comfortable, um, especially um, during the breaks and while eating together. So in this um, informal atmosphere, they could very easily uh, talk to each other and also get in touch with the invited speakers. So um, we are collaborating really a lot with uh, the ABG. We uh, participate in those cross-border workshops, but we also organize other uh, career orientation workshops with them. And we also uh, post our job offers on, the, uh, on their website. So on our website, we have uh, featured this collaboration. Um, on, when you go to the uh, career page, you have one page that is dedicated to um, PhD candidates. And here um, uh, we show that we um, that uh, ABG is one of our uh, training providers uh, to help the PhD candidates with uh, their professional development. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Um, ready to take questions, if there are any. Very much, Mamoudie. We've been taking questions about these cross border actions. So, please. Yes, Yanka. If, if I may ask, uh, um, I was really curious about this multidisciplinary approach. As when you are introducing the uh, labor market uh, uh, in the in the region, in the cross-border region, um, I mean, it's quite different for, let's say, uh, labor market in life sciences and let's say labor market for those who are maybe from the social sciences and, and humanities. So how do you deal with this, with this multidisciplinarity actually um, to still make it, uh, uh, like to have a sense for, for the people from, from cross the disciplines? I think I, I will take this one. Mm -hmm. um, it's, 
well, of course, what we're presenting is an overview. It's not the whole job markets in different fields so, and in different sectors. Um, but what we're especially trying to show is how to use different tools to get this knowledge of uh, um, the job market in the specific countries. So yes, we give some examples of jobs that exist, of some platforms that exist in for more social science or health sciences. And then we really encourage these participants to do their own research. Of course, it's impossible for us to introduce everything that is possible for a PhD. Well, it's ultimate place where, <laughs> of many, many opportunities. But what we're really, um, our goal is to learn um, participants to use these tools and to go really far with these tools and to do their own research at any stage. Because, well, um, as a PhD holders, maybe now their career is, their career plan is one thing, Three years afterwards, they, especially it might be a generational thing, uh, they would decide to change. So at least our tools, this is something helpful for the whole career, and especially help them to, to understand the mechanism and then to, to do their own work. That's why, well, it's working the, no matter the disciplines. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Yes, Adam. Thank you for the detailed presentation. Uh, almost everything is clear. I just have one question. How do you recruit participants uh, for these uh, events? What is the, the, the process? What's the, what's, what's the method you use? And if it's working well? And also, if there is a, uh, an over over uh, let's say application and how do you deal with that? Thank you. I maybe will start more and then you will complete also on the institutional part. So there's uh, actually, well, first we're all agree on the procedures on the agenda. So we have um, the article with um, application form and with the program that we will try start to disseminate it's about uh late july that we start the selection for the workshop in november um so participants from each country have different schedule for application but it's still the same application uh, where they specify the topic and especially the motivations and based on these motivations we do the selection so for many previous years, ABG were, was in charge of French participants and German participants. And since on our side, it's open really to all institutions. So sometimes, yes, we get more uh, candidates that there's places for French and German organizations. So it was really based on the, let's say, urgencies for the candidate to really find the, the way to, to build their career plan and especially their motivation. So this is our selection. And then there's also selection on the institutional level. Can you complete the answer? Yeah, we, we always do call for applications by email. And um, I collect then the applications and I do the, uh, the pre-selection. We have... Uh, different selection criteria, like such as the motivation or um, whether people are already close to the uh, end of their work contract or just at the beginning. So we prefer to take those that are um, closer to the end of the work contract or when it's PhD candidates, those who are uh, close to final, finalizing their PhD. And um, if I notice that I do not get enough applicants, then I start contacting people uh, individually by email or I call them or if I'm, I meet them uh, in the institute, I talk uh, to them directly about this, about this workshop. And this usually works best to motivate them. We also always send them a few testimonials from the previous years 
or tell them that they can get in touch with the people who participated the previous years to get directly their, uh, their input. So, so far, no, um, we always managed to fill um, all the, the places that were reserved for our institute and same for the other research institutes and the University of Luxembourg. Okay, and uh, since the application is quite, uh, I would say, uh, serious, uh, how, 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 let's say, simple question, how long is the typical uh, application file from one participant? Because it also reflects the effort that they have to put into it to apply, I mean. The, the document of application, it's just one page. Oh, okay. Like well, the the first page with the contact information, the work, the institution of attachment, and the second page, uh, the motivation and their thoughts on their career, uh, like why they want to to join this uh, this workshop. Mm, okay, thank you. So of course, and the, and might... the CV as well. Yeah. Yeah, CV. Of course, they might reflect a little bit why they want to join this workshop, but it's not the application for a fellowship. <laughs> Are there more questions? Actually, I do have, if that's okay. Yes, <laughs> um, so my question is that, you know, first of all, very many things for absolutely interesting information sharing and knowledge sharing. But, you know, my question is that we are speaking a lot about, uh, uh, I'm just in my own country, the university level as well, about how to help. And we all know this is a challenge and just how they actually transfer to labor market after the uh, PhD studies. But the question is that, uh, what are the, first of all, because of your uh, huge experience, what are those major challenges? Why it, not, it doesn't happen that smooth as want the key challenges of their transferring to labor market and what do you think from your own experience we speak about um, a lot about helping out phd students to apply to make right applications and all this stuff but what is the role of the employer as well just because i think that unfortunately only one individual phd can actually work for all the labor markets in the whole european countries but i guess the employers themselves we should agree on some common terms somehow to find the right candidate because i i see this challenge and just like this at least at our at our place mm -hmm. so if my if my question is uh, clear for you what i mean the major challenges and also what is the role of the employers somehow to make this cultural or whatever difference is more common and uh, common, common grounded. Yeah, um, I will start with the, the part well, why it's not going so smoothly as it should be. Um, maybe uh, because at some institutions, some countries, PhD um, program is still seen as a study because well, it's a diploma behind and um let's say supervisors are also well, they, they love academia and maybe they're trying to inspire their uh, their phd candidates to stay in academia to show that this is the place where things are happening i cannot generate make the general generalization but um, what we see during our trainings is that like um, when we ask, okay, well, your PhD holder, PhD candidates, list us things you know how to do or just answer what you know how to do. And the answer is that I know how to do research. It, well, PhD is never just doing research. There's many things. So maybe, it, might come from some institutions on the discourse that well phd is a research and not that it's a professional experience with multiple skills that could be used elsewhere in my opinion i don't know if you well this this part of the of question i think it's uh, also all of you can give your um your thought on this part um and then about companies, it's true that once again, it could be cultural in some countries like Luxembourg, Germany, well, companies are now this added value of PhD holders and there's less uh, 
problems to see uh, to accept someone some applicants with a phd it's less the case in france it's even lesser case in italy um with well, our institution at least abg it's also one of the goal to convince these companies and to work on explanation that actually phd holders they're great source of well, the great uh, um skillful applicants so um for sure for any job position that involves some research or even uh, project development uh, they are more relevant for several companies than just people with a master's degree. So we do also this education work. Of course, it's not like so quickly for all companies to understand. But well, in France, we see these changes that more and more companies are also looking, for, especially for PhD holders. But it's still well, communication to explain this added value of uh, these profiles. I don't know if you agree, disagree is the question for uh, all of you. What do you think from your experience? It's very interesting what you, what you mentioned and it's a major challenge for us, uh, basically that uh, it's one thing to tell PhDs that there are opportunities uh, outside academia, but the other thing is to actually um, make employers understand that PhDs are uh, like highly qualified and very relevant candidates. We, we challenge this a lot in Slovakia. That there are not so many companies uh, who actually are aware of, of the value of PhDs. And that's why I would be also really interested uh, in how do you try to actually to, to engage employers more, especially those who, who, have, who are not yet engaged, but uh, have a potential to be uh, employers for PhD candidates? What, kind of activities do you have in this regard that would be really interesting for us. And just to complete what we do at ABG is really one-to-one -one talk. So since we have our recruitment department, well, Floriana and uh, Laurence, they uh, are going to companies to introduce, well, first of course, ABG, but especially what a PhD candidate means globally so we do this work and then since we communicate organize um events we're inviting people from companies so little by little they also see the interest they see they received a newsletter and they see that oh actually some other company uh, was involved in in this event oh this is strange why why is this this company is working with this association that works with phd holders maybe there's something happening maybe we should also contact them so little by little they acknowledge that oh there's an interest for us as well great thank you and interesting to hear that competition works in this case as well. <laughs> Miriam, ha uh, have I replied to all your complex questions? Or sure, sure. You know, it's, it's not a question. It's like more an open topic of discussion. Yeah. It can be answered directly and very easily, but it's, it's simply a thing to, just to think about. But uh, once again, what what you say, what are the key most key challenges for PhD applicants to get employed? Um, I would say to be convinced that they are ready, that they also a valuable material for companies. Because once they're convinced, once they themselves, they see the links in their previous work as a PhD holder, or in this thesis or postdoctoral contracts, but they also use the right vocabulary mm. and the right written communication also. It actually sends tiny signals to recruiters to say that, hi, well, I have great skills, but I also know how to explain you complex things and see my written communication. I know what you're expecting. 
So it's like presentation or marketing on self, but how it is different from any other field. You know, the same challenge has everybody when you go to an employer. You simply need to kind of sell yourself to them. Why it's more difficult with PhD holders? Once again, I think they, some of them are stuck to the top research topic. And uh, when we discuss skills, it's mainly like, I know how to do this thing. Okay. And they don't sometimes don't even aware that what they actually do is project management. Mm. They, they manage different resources that mm. they create and their communication. Mm. And um, also, I think sometimes um, what we see also working with companies is that it's really rare for PhD holders to get hired because of their expertise, because of their scientific topic. Mm. Well, maybe with the exception of really very specific R&D project, in this case, yes, well, they will be hired because of their skills. Otherwise, it's soft skills. Mm. And well, after three or four years of working on something very tiny, very specific, when someone says like, broaden your horizons, it's not that easy to accept because well, they were trained to be experts on one thing and then- Limited, you, yeah, limited yeah. opportunities, yeah, I guess. Okay. Oh. Yeah. And one my last comment, just because we also discussed it at my university in Finland, Tampere University, that you know, so we also are trying how to, first of all, re, uh, uh, how to attract and then retain them as uh, employees. And so I have thought a lot, you know, we also notice those kind of lack of skills of presentation or whatever, but you know, on the other hand, it's really very strange and you gave me a very good kind of feedback hint, if I can say so, that people who have gone all the levels of education, highly, most highly educated people, like PhD they have done, right? They simply can't present themselves. Is that the, the like it's reality? And it's really, it's really kind of, I don't know, but how can we help? I don't know. Someone who has done all the levels of education and PhD and has done that much research and everything, and then afterwards they have this kind of small problems how to present, present themselves to the employee, okay? <laughs> simple, but interesting. Yeah. Well, in our trainings and also on uh, communication, sometimes we do specific articles on how to prepare CVs or written communication and then how to communicate. We use different tools, methods to structure a very easy communication, just well, mm -hmm. how to pitch in front of someone who's not an expert, no. what elements to highlight, how to structure the pitch and just well, first, by giving these elements, since we're talking about tools, well, PhD holders, they love tools. So it's like, okay, so this is uh, a basic thing. Well, I can understand. And then we always do practice with the feedback. So it's something that they see that, oh, there's a ground behind and I can practice this and I can even use this in multiple contexts. So this is something that uh, maybe first, um, yes, there's like, well, why shall I explain what I'm doing in simple words? But by practicing, by getting feedback and um, practicing again and again, they see the interest. And especially during the networks when even afterwards, uh, we receive some feedback saying like, oh, I actually tried some pitching um, introduction in conferences and it worked. I made contacts with this and this. Uh, so yeah, like providing them tools, giving this first element of practice and encourage. A lot of our trainings go for encouragement. Mm. Absolutely right, but from an employee's point of view, just because once again, one number of top priorities is to get international research at the Tampere University is that maybe we should also learn and maybe you should also help us as employees to 
learn how to ask the exact and right questions what actually hints them what to answer mm -hmm. and how to present themselves. It's also one of the, those questions what we ask is, I, I, I'm, I'm from human resource um, group. My previous work background is there. So I also think that the questions we give them never gives them possibility to understand what we're looking for. Yeah. It's also one of the things what we have to address and just through trainings, I guess. Mm, it's true. It's, it's true that uh, all well in the majority of cases, it's one direction training about let's say the vocabulary. It will be PhD holders mm. who are trained to use the, the vocabulary. Never um, HR people that mm. well maybe you also can tailor your communication while receiving the PhD mm. holder. Well, Sometimes we're trying to also to explain while well, explaining what is added value of PhD holders. Also to mention some common elements of any PhD candidate. So yeah, little by little, yes, mm -hmm. the companies that are open to these candidates, they also start in using the, the vocabulary that could be um, easily understood uh, mm -hmm. such profiles. It will, yeah, I would agree that well, it should be two ways. Yeah. Mm. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you for your comments. Um, if there's no question on this part of uh, cross-border workshop, so I thank one once again, Malu, for uh, for your uh, testimonial. Uh, let's take a fifteen minutes break. As well, the screen is not that easy, and then we will continue also with um, uh, informational days that we organize and intercultural part of uh, of these activities. Okay, so see you in fifteen minutes. Okay, let's continue the presentation and our so I hope you're all back uh, behind your screen uh, my screens. To continue uh, this part on our cross-border actions, I would also like to talk about information day uh, we have well, two so two examples of this um, the first one the franco german day for early career researchers um, the first edition of this information day was in 2014 and this year, well, next week, there will be the seventh edition. Um, initially, uh, it was one day uh, offering uh, one day of information. So it was some um, um, topics, talks on um, thematics linked to the PG career development. And then on the afternoon, it was various workshops um working into small groups and that is the day was ended by an opera doc that you already saw uh, on uh, professional opportunities in this franco german area uh, so that was the initial form and then it became a half day uh, the same well, we offer some thematic conferences and um afterwards well, conferences on mobility schemes, on different opportunities in academia, and also, of course, outside academia. And the, uh, the day ends with a cocktail uh, with this networking moment. So um, this information day is so uh, always held in Germany, in Berlin, with the exception of the session 2020 so that one it was online 
and held in English, but uh, if not the, the on-site uh, events is always in two languages, in French and in German, with um, translators present on place and all the um, participants and speakers are wearing um, earrings or uh, earrings, um, the masks to, to hear the translation. Um, so the target audience uh, may start from master's students to PhD holders, but also career manager officers, um, international relations managers, and of course, well, research organizations globally, recruiters, uh, whether it's public or private sectors. Because behind the idea is, of course, also to develop professional network well, for the um, participants, PhD candidates, but also on institutional level. Um, well, it's free of charge, uh, but there's a re registration, the same open to all uh, who is interested in, in this professional area between France and Germany. Um, the goals, of course, well, to deliver information on job opportunities, some realities on these two job markets in France and Germany, um, in academic and industrial sectors, and also, uh, well, create the space where candidates uh, could meet potential recruiters and learn, of course, more about the recruitment pro procedures, how to prepare their CV and ask questions, also how to, how to communicate, how to um, get ready for the interview for some particular companies. So uh, some pictures, um, what I said that the, we try different uh, formats with partners. So from the very beginning, the partners were um, well, the uh, French embassy in Germany, also Institut Francais in Berlin, Campus France, Deutschland, and well, ABG and some other also partners uh, from industry companies that were willing to participate and to, um, um, to talk about the, uh, the company and uh, how they, um, why they recruit uh, PhD holders. Um, the webinar part was in English, otherwise it's French and uh, German. Um, we also invite some mobility institution, institutions like, as I put on this um, slide like that or Sierra um, to talk about the, um, um, the mobility schemes also, of course, were partners for this event with uh, Franklin German University, who's also been presenting their uh, joint PhD programs. So it's really uh, the place where uh, different stakeholders, not just PhD holders, but also institutions working um, with PhD holders might find, find interest and to expand their network. Um, all this, uh, the quick uh, feedback from participants of 2016 uh, um, about the day, well, yes, this, um, the information day on fundings, but especially, once again, the keywords is network. And um, since uh, the latest format is a half day with a cocktail, so it's quite short really to go into details, but we're trying always to transmit tools that could be, and to show how it works. So these people could, uh, well, these people, PG candidates, PhD call holders could um, use them afterwards. And um, since our different uh, partner institutions are present, present, um, 
during the, this uh, information day. So it's always, it's also a possibility to exchange directly. Of course, our institution, whether it's Campus France, um, University, Franco German University or ABG or others are always open to contact. So this, uh, um, our, our audience can always join us by phone or by email, but still, it's always nice to meet um, people uh, in real life. And it's usually what is also highly appreciated to know well, there's a real people behind these events. And it's not just to give information, but also to, um, to exchange and to get feedback in both ways. Um, so this is about uh, Franken German Information Day. Uh, we also started last year, the, there was first edition of Frank Italian Day for early career researchers, the title, but the program, the Information Day, once again, is open also to mobility professionals, um, uh, research organizations and companies. Um, this one is held in English, so from the very beginning, well, the first session was online, so it wasn't really an option about a linguistic uh, part of, of the event, so it, the choice was um, to held it in English. Um, but the next edition in October it will be in Turin on site, will be also held in English. So um, really uh, the, the idea is to propose this direct exchange and not to depend on the, um, on the translators the, the, whole, the whole day. So um, the Frank Italian Day is a, a half day program, uh, of course, on the opportunities. Um, and tools how to build professional project in this Frank Italian area. Um, and um, the first session was really um, the focus was on um, mobility, the so really different mobility program programs on different stage whether it's before the PhD to find the right joint PhD program or during the PhD or after your PhD for, uh, mobility programs for postdocs, but also for, um, for the industry. So it was really an overview. And the next edition will be um, the main topic is networking. So we'll be talking about this networking tools how to network, how to get maximum information and well, positive output from uh, these techniques and how to develop also these networking skills. Um, and once again, to, to propose this space where uh, these participants could develop their professional network. And this is some pictures from the first edition. Um, so what are main advantages of this um, cross-border um, information day? Well, first, once again, to grow, helping to grow international um, network, whether it's for institutions, for companies, and for researchers. So it's been back to the, our previous discussion about also how to include companies. So we're trying to, well, at least companies that are invited there, they're also trying to well, be more open to um, the academic way of doing things and to understand also the way of functioning on the other side. Um, of course, it's also the space where uh, you can meet really diverse profiles, well, whether it's diversity based on disciplines or uh, professional horizons or, of course, the sectors and countries. So even once again, it's the Franco-Italian day or Franco-German days 
Um, after June, among participants, we see that well, also people from other countries um, have attended this uh, these days. So well, and they stay the the whole day the, or the half of day because well, they see some parallels, some uh, also tools that could be used um, in their countries. Um, so the, that's why it's great, even if let's say the the main topic is between this uh, cross-border relations between two countries, but we're always thinking about like, okay, how can we, how can we also be open for others and how uh, people from other countries could um, get some advice uh, um, in their work. About online format, um, oh, it's, possibility to reach a wider audience and really that is not based to the country or to the city of the event. So it's really uh, the, the latest event. It was the Franco Italian Day in uh, last October. So really we had participants from the United States, Israel, China. Um, the was positive uh, thing and that of course, if it was on site, well, maybe we will have less of these international profiles. And of course, um, possibility to attract also more diverse profiles. We also had colleagues from Eurexess, uh, uh, France, uh, and Italy. You could also participate, but sometimes could be less the case for the on site um, events. Um, thank, thank you, Miriam, for your, uh, for your message. Um, so um, the overall output of all these cross-border actions, well, first, of course, researchers in international mobility are living a very emotional, personal, and professional experience. You perfectly know that. But it's also an experience that helped them to acquire multiple skills and qualities. And so by participating in these cross-border events, researchers become aware also of, uh, of their soft skills, what I mentioned before, and qualities, and learn also how to market them, whether it's uh, in written or, or oral communication. And also, um, by creating these actions, we really provide access to information and the possibility to know how to identify different opportunities for um, any participant. So it's really this idea of, um, well, we're not here just to give you information, but we're also here to help you learn how to find this information. So this is very important. And of course, the, why is it important to make researchers become aware of these skills? Well, because these are what companies are looking for. Um, and to understand also this, this needs, we advise to researchers to do monitor because of different, um, um, job jobs that exist and we we'll also do this monitor so I prepared a, a sh short selection of uh, job offers just to see what skills are needed uh, by companies what they are looking for um, so what are these needs? Uh, the first examples is for junior science officer and science connect. So it's um, kind of consultancy organization and nonprofit organization um, that uh, provided uh, services for research organization, uh, for networking, some expert support. Um, they also help uh, this organization write proposals to help with financial part of project. And so they're looking for this uh, junior science officer. And of course, well, this 
standard presentation of the employer, uh, some specific um, competencies they are looking for is so a PhD or master degree. So it's sometimes for um, more project management skills, it also be the case that will the profile between PhD and master, um, but still with the uh, research experience. So well, sometimes master's degree, they don't have this research experience. Um, some also technical skills, so um, well, Microsoft system, but also websites, um, English, uh, also knowledge of some other European language, uh, knowing this uh, European um, space and uh, European science policy. But uh, when we see, uh, when we look at soft skills, well, they're looking first for someone who's creative, willing to take initiative and consciously improved minded, also transparency in working and a team oriented work ethic and good communication skills across cultural and scientific boundaries, showing discretion, diplomacy and tolerance. So, you see for um, a job uh, in well, science-oriented job, there's um, a lot of soft skills this company is looking for, and also well, the even intercultural skills. That will be the last part of uh, our week visit. Another ex another example is for a biology scientist in the South. So also um, it's a biotech company, French biotech. Um, you see for this um, position, it's not even required um, to have, well, there's no geographical mobility, no international trips, but still in profile. Well, of course, they are looking for a PhD, with experience in genetics, um, biology, and so on. Also, uh, already with experience, um, previous experience, and expertise in analyzing results, uh, or something common to all PhDs. And also, they're looking for someone with ability to work in a international team, including good command of spoken and written English, cultural sensitivity, sensitivity and flexibility. Even if the position is without uh, international interactions, mainly. Another example is from um, Hosim. So there was also in um, um, company working with materials. So they're looking for a uh, R&D engineer. Um, his profile was well, someone from um, ecological engineer, and um, they are looking for someone already with an international background, or well, it would be a, pl a plus with experience abroad in multicultural environment. And then the standard things like English and French also, and some also they emphasize his soft skills innovative problem solving, uh, open-minded team player, uh, ability to, uh, to learn uh, communication skills. Another example is for economists, so more social scientists at Technopolis. So it's also um, a European uh, consultancy organization. And so for their analyst, economist slash analyst, they're looking, well, PhD in economics, so like technical skills, or technical experience linked to, to this PhD, but also excellent command of spoken and written French, English, um, Spanish would be a plus, and ability to work in a multicultural environment. And the last example is from saint uh research. So they are looking for a research engineer in physics of industrial processes. Um, 
all the once again the um, the presentation of the company and then in profile someone of course with experience in related fields so they'll open to some fields engineering physics mathematics um, but also they're looking for excellent oral and written communication skills um, and ability to communicate efficiently um, and this aptitude to work efficiently and cooperatively in multicultural environment. So you see among skills, there's a lot of this multicultural or intercultural experience. And that's why we're, well, we're really trying to emphasize first this cross-border actions, but also to talk about um, intercultural side of uh, research work. That's why um, uh, we started also to, pre to propose a workshop on development of intercultural competence uh, in a professional setting. The goal is to help researchers really to, to enhance, to strengthen their intercultural experience. Um, also, well, to improve their ability to act um, in different cultural contexts. And cultural means uh, on different level of culture, whether it's country culture, um, professional culture or organizational culture or team culture. So really to acquire this competence that could be helpful to adapt in these diverse contexts. Um, so uh, we have also different formats. It could be one day or two days of a very immersive workshop based on participants' experiences. So once again, it's not we arriving and talking about um, cliches, <clears throat> sorry, but when we're trying to really um, encourage participants to find, to make the, these individual reflections on their own cultural rules and some prejudices, um, some worldview frameworks they have in order to understand others. So um, it's open to PhD candidates and also postdocs from all fields. So it's really of the broadened experience. And um, we also trying to provide some uh, tools on clear communication across cultures, um, some attitudes, so also to value skills uh, linked to this international experience. And also some tools how to process um, cultural shock. So some advice uh, to find bal balance between work and personal life. Um, advantages of this, um, this workshop. Well, of course, there's opportunity to share this personal experience, the possibility well, to step a little bit outside of this strictly research framework and to talk about, to express some of their doubts of problems or difficulties to integrate uh, in once again, a very friendly environment. Also to learn how to value the international experience, because once again, sometimes when we are working on CVs, um, if we see international experience mentioned among skills, there's almost nothing. And, um, I give you an example from a um, few months ago. Um, there was uh, a PhD holder in um, uh, psychology. Um, he went, he spent one year in Australia, one year in New Zealand, he was really um, working as um, an, uh, how do we call it, au pair uh, boy. Um, and um, there was 
literally nothing of on this international experience. And when I asked why, well, maybe you develop some tolerance uh, capacity, some empathetic skills, uh, some listening skills. Uh, why don't you mention it? And he was like, well, it's so obvious. Well, it's not obvious. And researchers, they're very international, very intercultural. Our work is also to show that even in this international frame, framework, they already developed many um, intercultural attitudes, knowledge, skills. So they should also to let recruiters know about it. Um, and well, there's uh, the, the last advantage is my personal advantage is uh, my personal advantage of uh, building this intercultural ambassador network. So really, we're also trying not to say like, this is intercultural tools to help you, but with the idea that one day you will help also newcomers to integrate better. So once participants are going through this um, workshop, they become these intercultural ambassadors. They have their role to do in um, really um, helping others also to live um, this intense experience uh, in a good way. Um, so this is the intercultural part. Um, I also prepared the, um, for you a question uh, about interculturality. Well, the question is, well, first, uh, what does it mean to you? What does interculturality mean to you? And also, well, since we're a very small committee, we will just chat directly. Um, what would you add to this notion of interculturality? And also, what is the connection between interculturality and your work at your, your access? And also, how can you help researcher, researchers to become aware of their own intercultural competence? Well, if you already have some ideas, but at least let's chat about this interculturality notion and how it's linked to our work uh, at your access. When do you think? I can start <laughs> if you want to. <laughs> yeah, I, I was still here. <laughs> um, I think it's uh, the interculturality um, highlights um, different concepts of cultures, of course. Um, it allows to understand the others and the foreigners, for, for example, but with, with uh, respect. I mean, um, it leads to respect the culture of each other and it has established different, um, um, different value, uh, common values, mm -hmm. not different, uh, <laughs> common values. And to integrate people with different values and cultures um, in a non-invasive uh, way, um, yeah. I, can, I think. So with the respect of each one's background. Mm. Yeah, yeah, with the respect, yeah. Okay, thanks. What about others? What do you think about interculturality? For us, it's your access. Uh, it's probably it's a daily part of our lives. We uh, cannot see very well you, Yanka. I think you, you, you might get ah, yeah. far away. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, for us, at uh, your access, that's just daily part of our lives. And I cannot imagine like uh, being part of your access and not being open to interculturality. The other thing that uh, it's not that automatic, uh, and especially for us uh, in the countries where maybe the level of interculturality is not that high, like for example, in France. So in our region, uh, it's quite challenged sometimes. Um, um, 
I would say to have a skills how to deal with this. Uh, mm -hmm. Because like, uh, for example, uh, if you live in a very multicultural uh, environment um, uh, from from the early childhood, then you are socializing in the way that you are uh, able to to work with interculturality. For us, it's often something we have to we have to learn. <laughs> Well, once we are adult, uh, especially for those who do not have much um, uh, intercultural experience, and that's why I also think even in your access, there is a still need for this type of trainings, not only for researchers, but also for your access staff. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's an important part of our work. Um, and uh, if we are not lucky to, uh, to have an environment in which it is, is natural, we need to learn this. So that's just about your access and intercultural from my point of view. Yeah, absolutely agree. Thank you, Yanka. Any more on this? Yes, Rebecca. Yeah, um, you were talking about the training, Yanka, and I was also thinking we we um, offer a on a regular basis a workshop on intercultural competences for international researchers. Um, it's a very good workshop, but what we notice is that very often the people who are actually even signing up, who are signing up to these workshops are people who are already aware of the importance of, of uh, interculturality. Uh, so the, the challenge is often how to make it more. Yeah, how, how to make those who need it the most um, um, to, yeah, to learn more about it, to expand their horizons and to, yeah, so, um, mm. That's what I'm, I'm thinking about right now. Uh, when it's, also, it's also the case for us. Well, they, uh, mainly it's me who uh, did these trainings. Um, and I see that the majority of participants, they are already, as you said, aware of the, this important. And when I have very few uh, participants, they always say that I don't know anything. I really have just monocultural background and then when we trying to work on it well they already know something they're just not really aware that it also counts that they experience even being a monocultural uh human let's say uh also well, this is impossible to not to get in touch with this interculturality and sometimes it's it's funny that by the end of the workshop they are uh, realizing that, oh, actually, I am also intercultural, even my, if my family background is monocultural. It's always so fun to, to see this. Well, they already have everything. It's just for well, the guidance to make them realize that uh, it's too much of, uh, of what they have to offer. Adam, you wanted to add something? Yes, thank you. Uh, I would uh, join uh, Yanka because uh, our country is also, in terms of culture, it's quite homogenous. It's not, I wouldn't say it's a multicultural country in general. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, increasingly in higher education mm -hmm. and research and in companies, you encounter the intercultural context because these two, uh, let's say, uh, types of uh, workplace are increasingly getting uh, multicultural in terms of, uh, you know, internationalization, many nationalities working together and so on. So uh, it's important, I think, to, to prepare young uh, researchers or would-be researchers for this so that they don't have to do it first thing when they are fully immersed in this situation. And uh, just to, I have two possible points of further thinking for this. I'm just opening it up uh, as, as suggestion. One is that uh, probably it's very important to, to uh, prepare both sides. If, uh, if an intercultural meeting happens to pre pre prepare, prepare both sides for this, like uh, for example, there's an incoming researcher to a university from somewhere. And then it's not just the incoming person's uh, uh, perspective 
which is important that he or she is uh, getting uh, prepared for this, but also the receiving uh, place, venue, whatever, uh, office, because it will be a challenge for them also. Same, same for companies. And the other point, number two, that is really a, maybe a wild idea, but uh, I cannot help ask, is that the, is interculturality in its structure, in its uh, maybe its psychological procedure, is it similar to uh, the, the phenomenon when uh, a researcher working in academia gets into the private sector and then there's suddenly a different set of expectations and interactions and uh, company culture, you know, which is surrounding, I think, the procedure and the situation itself is very similar to when different cultures meet because they, they are cultures in a sense also, academic culture and non-academic culture. So maybe uh, training could also take this into account, at least where you don't have this uh, uh, train training uh, in place yet. So this is my short reflection. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. I would totally agree. Oh, about your first um, remark, uh, the, the, it should be go two ways. I absolutely agree. And there's always the question, who should adapt to whom, who should start, whether it's host countries uh, or the host organization or newcomers. And there's always, well, we expect, well, we like global, we uh, uh, expect that the newcomers who should put more into the integration. And of course, when you are newcomers, <laughs> a newcomer somewhere well it's a huge process and sometimes it's not that easy to be just the only one trying to adapt and to understand and control all cultural codes i totally agree that well we cannot provide just one way but well we should start somewhere and for now luckily newcomers are more open to this and I really hope that one day also institutions, organizations will be saying like, well, why are just newcomers are learning how to integrate? Let's, let's do this all together. It's my biggest dream. Um, and about the notion of interculturality. I forgot to mention that I also have, a, I'm a PG holder myself in intercultural management. That's why I'm talking about this uh, from my expertise. And I really love this notion of interculturality when it's not strictly linked to countries' cultures. For me, it's, I absolutely agree, it's just environment of uh, different and diverse codes, whether it's uh, yeah, switching from one country to another or switching from one <laughs> sector to another. I, I absolutely agree with this. And uh, what, what I'm trying to, uh, to make these researchers understand that once you get some tools to learn how to adapt uh, in one country, because well, culture, country culture is something more visible, especially when you change the language. But then when we work into deep experience of that, they're trying to realize, oh, actually I can use this even switching a team. So yeah, it's, uh, that's why um, I really uh, love when there's uh, this broad notion of interculturality and not to get stuck with these uh, cliches on one culture's code. Uh, no, like, well, it's, for me, it's an old way to see interculturality. And uh, um, fortunately, it's not enough. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we're also trying to encourage to think more uh, um, of far away from cultures and really to, to see, okay, how can, how can these international researchers also use this in any new context? And um, the last point will be, well, uh, some researchers, of course, may think that uh, well, they don't really have 
this intercultural competence, as I mentioned in the previous example, or they don't have this inner quality such as empathy or diplomacy that well they don't feel like they are naturally have it but well this i prepared some list of questions that can help researchers to realize that well their experience has already um, allowed them to develop a set of these intercultural skills um, and it may also assist them in assessing current strengths so of course, well, what is your relevant experience um, doing research in different countries, sectors, industries? So all of this would just were uh, discussed. So maybe just switching a team um, already launch a process of this cultural adaptation to a new team. Or what is your international experience? Uh, how your international experience shaped you? And once again, to guide them through the fact of living abroad or working globally or being in uh, inter intercultural relations uh, or having a diverse background itself, having a neighbor from a foreign country, uh, a friend. So for sure, by exchanging with these uh, people in primary network, we also develop uh, these skills or uh, and also to think, okay, it, it seems like I have some of these skills uh, where in my current position or in my future position, I can use this intercultural skill set. And in the examples, what I showed you previously, there was always communication in different languages, team building, some uh, conflict uh, resolution, um uh, being a leader for, uh, or work with different stakeholders so even if a skill itself that is uh researched by organization it's not something for example the fact know how to collaborate with different stakeholders it's not particularly linked to this intercultural experience but when these researchers will think about examples when they put into practice, they could state their international experience and to say, well, actually I've been working with my research team, with the company, because I was uh, uh, also a half time in the company and we launch also collaboration with uh, another country. So it's really important to push, think about their international experience and the skills they uh they developed but the most important thing and before we ask those questions uh to researchers actually we need to answer them first really to understand our own cultural background and also our own cross-cultural experience to help others guide um to help them in their um in the adaptation and also in their self assessments of these skills. So, when we are aware, also, when Yanke, you were talking about this, but sometimes it's not that easy um, to know what skills you should to use. Well, by reflection, okay, what have I learned by? Uh, welcoming these international researchers. What I know um, how to put into practice, what can my concrete intercultural skills. Um, well, that was the last slide. <laughs> I hope it inspired you to some reflections. Um, I will also take some last questions about uh, this uh, information days or uh, intercultural um, activities we have. Yes, I have a, a question actually. Yeah. Um, if I understand well, you work for, uh, you, you collaborate with uh, Italy and Germany and also Lux Luxembourg. Uh, what kind of organizations you collaborate with the other side? Uh, in the other countries 
And also uh, the reason I asked that is because it feels very valuable for French universities to have you because not everyone needs to develop their local carrier services. And it, it's something in, in Sweden, it's very uneven between those who have a very um, um, enhanced um, career mm -hmm. services from those who have nothing and those a bit in between. So that's why it would be very valuable for us to also have a national uh, entity <laughs> that yeah. works uh, the same way. So how do you, do you also work with promoting what to do with other, in other countries? Yeah, um, so uh, these three countries, it's uh, the, the most uh, like, um stable relations because we we'll have multiple actors in these countries but also we work for example with uh uk embassy or multiple embassies um in france to promote different fellowships of muslim communication level so um how we establish these relations, it went really two ways. Sometimes it was these embassies or organization institutions that contacted us. So it was lately with um, the uh, technology office in the UK embassy. We just learned that we exist. And so we're now uh, working on some uh, events to put together. Sometimes uh, it's network of the network. So for example, for the um, cross-border seminar. Um, now we have two university, uh, two German university partners, and actually it's uh, the University of Luxembourg who put us in touch, who explained that well, there's the network of this institution and we're doing this uh, workshop. Would you love to join us? So it could be a really different way. Um, and then, yeah, we're open to um, everyone so once again um, it could be on communication level so we can realize some articles about your events your fellowships uh, or other things it could be more deep collaboration to put into practice some trainings or to organize some events so yeah it's very well we have a broadened network and with each of uh, this organization, it's different type of relations. Interesting. And also about all um, this idea to launch maybe national organizations similar to ABG. Oh, yeah. Uh, I encourage you and so maybe uh, to specify how do we work um, so where almost half of our budget is financed by the French Ministry of Higher Education and the other half comes from trainings so if you're looking also to launch some national organizations similar to ABG maybe through the ministries you can propose these ideas uh, Mm. Yeah, thank you. Yes, Adam. Yeah, about uh, still uh, on the topic of interculturality, mm -hmm. uh, I saw in the agenda and it, it, it caught my eye, the, the game Dixit that is listed. And I would like to ask very briefly about that. Do you regularly use it? What's the experience? Because I, I think it's nice. And, uh, and I, I, I'm not personally, I'm not really into interculturality. I don't mm -hmm. uh, uh, encounter it, use it very much, but uh, th this is something uh, I would like to hear a bit about. So thank you. Yeah, well, Dixit cards, I don't know if you know about them. It's a game uh, um, with some abstract images, very different, that uh, express uh, different uh, situations. So it's like fairy tales situations with dragons or some princes or so on. So it's very broad in cards. And how do we use this? Um, to well it's like mostly as ice breaking activities so sometimes when we well, 
sometimes we just have a half of day to do the trainings. And uh, it's sometimes short really to um, create this friendly environment and secure it when the participants could freely express themselves. And these Dixit cards are actually helping us uh, or helping participants to express themselves. Because the idea is that, well, just one example of ice breaking when we use, but there's multiple use. One participant, well, each participant pick one card and then they show, uh, introduce themselves or they intercultural experience through this card. So basically they always start to explain why they pick this card what they see on this card, because, well, even as I said, they're very abstract cards. So it's what will be important is the interpretation of the situation of the card. And then little by little, explaining why they pick the card, what they see on the card, they become more open also to say, well, actually, it's because I did this and that. And it's the nice way to receive. Um, the interesting information, some personal information in a friendly way that is usually fun and not so strict, like, oh, let's have a round table and each of you introduce yourself in two minutes. Well, it's a lot of pressure. But when you pick just one card with a funny picture, you just can say, well, actually, let's say it's a card with a cat. I love this card. Because I picked this card because I love cats. And by the way, well, it's been um, a while that I'm uh, on international mobility. So uh, at home, I have two cats and I'm missing them. So, well, some, some very fun in personal information that could um, come out of these uh, Dixit cards. Thank you very much for the illustration. Indeed, it's very nice. Yes. Yeah. Well, I plan to, to use some, but well, it's, it's funny when well, we there are more people <laughs> to use. Is there more questions? Well, uh, you have my contact and then well, uh, also you saw some emails from my colleagues. Um, don't hesitate to contact me or my colleagues or, or if it's not me who you would love to contact, but someone from uh, communication department really, well, I, I'm, I can put you in touch. And then if you're um, having some information, some events coming up, really don't hesitate to send it to us. Well, we send these newsletters every month. So uh, I'm looking for information and I hope that well, somehow we can collaborate and uh, create new cross-border actions uh, between our countries. We had, uh, I can just say that, um... We had Berenice here, your former colleagues, a yeah. few years ago. And it's because she was um, one of the trainers at one of the Euraxis uh, Train the Trainers event in Bulgaria yeah. a few months before. And a good association to uh, your to ABG. Uh, ABG. Yeah, so well, unfortunately, Berenice left. I ABG. know, I know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but it uh, seems to keep up the good work anyway. So, yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all for uh, your re registration, also for your insights, your questions, your output. It was really nice meeting you. And well, I have your emails and uh, I also might contact you. Well, let's stay in touch. And thank you, Simona, for uh, providing this space also to exchange uh, among uh, your access um, network. Thank you, Christina, and your colleagues for all the interesting